Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ekaterina Zabrovskaya, Editor-in-Chief of Russia Direct, analytical media outlet about Russian foreign policy and Russia-US relations. And welcome to our first webinar. Today, um, we would like to initiate some discussion about Russian economic development, particularly from innovation, and the potential of the current crisis of Ukraine to uh, stem or boost uh, this development. And today, um, uh, uh, we are having here our authors uh, of our new quarterly report, uh, which is called The Future of Russia's Innovation uh, Economy. So, um, uh, here with us today, we have Stanislav Kachenko, Associate Professor at the School of International Relations at the St. Petersburg State University. Um, hi, Stanislav. Hi. Uh, Larissa Smirnova, an analyst for the Russian International Affairs Council and lecturer at Xiamen University in China. Hello, Larissa. Hello, everybody. And uh, joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. is also um, Adrian Erlinger, a program... Yeah, Thanks for having me. Yeah, a program manager for uh, innovation and capacity building programs at American Councils for International Education. Um, so I'd like first to thank all of you uh, for joining us today, and uh, why don't we go ahead and dig into uh, some of our questions. Stanislav, I would like to start with you. Um, what do you think about the future of Russian innovation, and what effect do you think the current uh, sanctions uh, over Ukraine could have on it? Well, the Russian Federation just started to develop uh, what is known as national innovation system, and uh, we already finished the process of development of legislation. All the needed legal acts have been done. All the key decisions from establishment of uh, institutions for the promotion of innovation already have been made. We have Rusnana, one of the largest uh, innovation company in the world. We have the largest in the world venture fund, which is Russian venture uh, company headed by Igor Gamirzian. We have a uh, scope of a project. So there is infrastructure in place. What we are missing, well, first of all, we are missing institutions, uh, which are badly needed for functioning of uh, innovation system in any country. Every country has its own national innovation system, but up to the point, because of there are general rules how innovation systems are functioning. Uh, so uh, we don't have institutions like independent court, uh, traditions to respect uh, legal uh, norms and agreements. Uh, we have lack of agencies which can provide businesses. Uh, our startups are doing quite well in Russia, but there are few of them compared to Silicon Valley or, or Boston area. So there are many uh, missing elements, uh, but still, if you'll put it in a historical perspective, you'll see that Russian innovation system is definitely on the rise. And uh, we may predict that Ceteris uh, Paribus, yeah, uh, we'll have um, uh, the developing uh, modern sector of economy. Uh, what we have today, that what is known as catch up modernization. So Russia is trying to uh, to develop a model or to invent, to construct a model which uh, uh, for some countries it took centuries or at least decades to construct. Uh, so there are goods and bads with this catch-up model, uh, but still uh, there are some uh, crucial decisions yet to be made for a Russian innovation system to function properly. For example, we didn't have for more than 10 years any significant economic reforms which, uh, in our country which can and help to accommodate the existing economic, political, and social realities to the external world. Uh, we also need uh, to, to follow the model of uh, promotion innovation system, which include uh, such elements like, for example, inviting the most talented people, by uh, keeping them in Russia. Uh, since the biggest players in the Russian economic uh, system are state corporations, these state corporations should be not just the drivers of economic growth, but also drivers for innovation. And you will look into the budget of uh, companies like Rosneft or Gazprom or Transneft, you will see the peanuts uh, used for uh, in the budgets so or financing goes for really 
uh, innovative technologies or e economic system. So, uh, from this point of view, the Russian uh, national innovation system is uh, on good track, but at the same time, there are many things uh, should be done and should be done immediately. And in this situation, sanctions which has been imposed already on Russia probably will be imposed in future days, I hope not, uh, definitely are the uh, barriers for, like technical barriers for normal functioning of uh, economic system in general. At the same time, uh, Russia now is really on the crossroad because of Russia may rely upon invisible hand of the market. So to wait then institutions of microeconomy will emerge and also institutions of innovation system. At the same time, Russia may construct the barriers uh, for uh, external goods or external products and we develop this import substitution uh, type of industry which has been done quite successfully in countries like uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, some other Asian countries and now uh, Russia may go this way and it looks like this option is on the table of officials in the government at the same time I hope that uh, Russian government will choose another way. So uh, to, to construct uh, walls or to, to develop some barriers for economic transactions, economic or trade uh, simply is not a really very good option. I see. Uh, Larissa, I'd like to jump to you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there is some potential for increased partnership between Russia and China with regard to innovation, especially under the current uh, 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 crisis um, between Russia and the West? Okay. Thank you, Katerina. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with all the experts and with you. Uh, okay, so first of all, it's a very hot topic. Uh, everybody is seeing now that Russia and China they are coming out of the Ukrainian crisis as close allies. But you know, I would take it with a lot of caution. It's been five years that I'm working in China, so in a way, I'm probably more familiar with the Chinese perspective than with the Russian perspective. So I would say that first of all, China's position, China's political position on the Ukrainian crisis has been extremely careful and there has been a lot of international speculation in the media uh, that China is supporting Russia uh, over Crimea and over the Ukrainian crisis. You know, I would say that China, uh, well, China did not explicitly object, but I would not say that China went as far as really its consequences of Russia. And China has stressed, the, the spokesperson of the foreign ministry of China has stressed that China supports the territorial uh, integrity of Ukraine. As far as I know, this situation has been. So we should really take uh, this, ally this alliance. There is no alliance between Russia and China. Their relationship is very good. Uh, their relationship is defined as a, a comprehensive strategic partnership with coordination. Uh, but this relationship is not an alliance. Yeah? So this, this is not the first point. And also, uh, with regard to innovation, you know, uh, as Stanislav mentioned, that Russia tends to compare itself to the United States. Uh, this comes from the from the long Cold War mentality when the Soviet Union was competing with the United States. You know, I would say when today. Russia is trying to compete with the United States in terms of innovation. We also should be extremely cautious. We should not overestimate uh, Russia's innovation potential. So uh, the, the Global Innovation Index, okay, it's just one index, it's just one study, but it, it puts Russia within top 50 countries in, top, in terms of innovation, 49th, if I remember correctly. So even China's perspective is much better China is ranked in number 29 uh, in the world, in the world, in the world, in the world. and Russia 20 positions. So I think that Russia's ambitions, uh, I'm Russian, so well, you know, I, I want my country to do very well, but I would say that Russia should really be cautious about its own ambitions and not to call the rest of it. And uh, there is definitely potential for cooperation between Russia and China. But again, we should not view this cooperation between Russia and China as a kind of alternative to Russia's cooperation with the West or to China's cooperation with the West 
China especially has extremely good relations with the West. Actually, again, there are some political, some minor political issues, but overall, China, in terms of economy, in terms of education, in terms of innovation, is very integrated into the Western system. I would dare say even probably more integrated than Russia is. And China's whole economic development for the recent 30 years, it, it's been due to its economic it's very good economic relations with the West. So first of all, China is definitely not willing to sacrifice its relationship with the West uh, for the sake of Russia. And second, also for Russia, uh, of course, the relationship now with the West has worsened. But I have talked to many Russian scientists, and they all say we are willing to cooperate with China, but we don't want to see this cooperation with China as an exclusive alternative to our cooperation with the West. Because, well, uh, overall, we can say that no kind of confrontation can help science. Cooperation with all parties can help science. So Russia and China should cooperate and should develop their partnership, but they should not turn it into any kind of a confrontation model. So the model for the cooperation between Russia and China uh, as I see it, is that actually Russia is still probably more advanced than China in terms of basic science. Uh, this is also partly due to the advances of the Soviet Union times. Uh, we should not exaggerate them again, but there are still some advances there. And China is probably more advanced technologically um, in terms of electronics, in terms of high-speed railways, those everyday technologies that China has been learning from the West, it is, very, it is more probably more advanced than Russia. And it is a priority for China to start to export these technologies. China now uh, views the export of these ready-to-use technologies uh, as an opportunity to transform its economic model from manual labor to a more advanced, more technolog technological one. So uh, this is the model for Russia-China cooperation. Uh, we take advantages of the Russian basic science where there are, and we take advantages of the Chinese ready-to-use technologies, uh, such as electronics and high-speed railways, and we merge the two of them, and uh, we, we take the Chinese finances. Financially, China is much more advanced now. If the Chinese government R and D spending is almost ten times higher than Russia's, and uh, okay, with, with this model, probably we can try to. Do it. Mm -hmm. Interesting, um, Adrian. And what's your take on all of this? Uh, do you think there is still an opportunity um, for innovation cooperation between Russia and the United States? Absolutely, I do. I think it's a matter of understanding each country's perspectives and our respective innovation ecosystems. I think first and foremost that the universities really provide this vital role, and I think it's quite underrepresented um, as a link to U.S.-Russia innovation, uh, innovation cooperation as well as science and business ties. I think the passing of Law 217 in 2009 uh, was a huge step from the Russian government to enact the legislation to grant uh, startups in technologies coming from the university to grant them the intellectual property and uh, getting these Mali uh, Innovazioni Predpriatia the status that they could go out and commercialize research. Um, I do think that on the U.S. side we have a tremendous respect for Russian research and science. Uh, the question is how do you commercialize the research? And I think this is really the, the perhaps the fundamental difference is that really we don't have state corporations in the United States that drive the innovation process. We have the private sector, and um, you know even the White House um, has come up with several initiatives to drive innovation. Uh, a great example is 3D printing and advanced manufacturing. But this is really a private public partnership that includes the universities playing a role in this. So while the White House is um, given some seed money for this project. It's really the business incubators, it's the local communities, it's the regional economic development officials who drive this process. 
And then the private sector sees the opportunity for commercialization and we can get on this. So I, I think a little bit is understanding that perspective of the, of the Russian side and, and of the U.S. side as well. Um, you know, certainly, I don't think the solution for Russian innovation is to be like Silicon Valley or to recreate Silicon Valley. Um, I think this is a matter of, of entrepreneurial culture, which is a difference in the United States and Russia. Um, I do think, though, that there's a tremendous example in the university context for both Russians and, and Americans to step outside of the lab, to step outside of their countries, and to connect, to see which opportunities are available that are innovative occurring in Russia, and, and to see really what markets are available for Russian technologies. Um, certainly, you know, state corporations will certainly be the driver of innovation in Russia going forward. But really, when we talk about innovation competition, we're talking about competing not just um, in, the, in the Russian market, but um, in terms of offering products for other countries. So this is also competing on the Asian market um, in, in Europe and in North America as well. So really, I, I think perhaps we need to step back and um, maybe have a different approach for U.S.-Russia innovation collaboration instead of being this top-down government-to-government type of partnership of really focusing on the startups and the research coming out of the universities to determine which markets, which consumers are best for these technologies. And really, I think the markets will decide. Good technologies will um, find a place for commercialization around the world. Mm -hmm. Adrian, what is your impression of the general attitude among uh, the American academic community? Do you think that uh, the current situation, the current crisis, uh, um, uh, the Ukraine crisis, um, has some effect on the cooperation between uh, um, uh, the U.S. and Russia? In terms of the academic community, in terms of the, uh, let's say, the business community that are not multinational companies, I think the the general approach is if a startup or a company or technology coming from Russia has potential for commercialization in the U.S. market, we embrace this. And um, in my interactions with regional economic development officials, whether it's on the state level, uh, working with the universities here in the United States, uh, they're very receptive to bringing Russians here to the United States for this um, knowledge exchange. Um, I, I think when you get to the level of multinational corporations, uh, companies that deal directly in the field where sanctions are, whether it's banking or in the um, oil and gas sector, it's a different issue. I think, um, I guess what I'm saying is that the uh, U.S.-Russia innovation, innovation partnership could really be driven more with individual researchers, academics, and startups. This is really going to drive that relationship forward. Uh, Stanislav, I'd like to jump back to you. Uh, just yesterday, Putin announced uh, a plan to increase funding to the Russian space program. Uh, he ordered construction uh, sped up on a multi-billion dollar spaceport in Russia's forest. Um, so do you think this is the right move, or should investment be directed more towards infrastructure projects, uh, like roads or uh, bridges? Well, I, I think that this exactly this decision has not been really strategic one. Russia is under heavy pressure of uh, having limited or pros prospects for limited access to uh, Baikonur. Um, Russia is paying a lot to Kazakhstan for using that. So the, exactly this decision about space center on the eastern borders of Russia is not really a symbol of of uh, macroeconomic policy uh, projected on future, but generally speaking, we now live in the country then public and private sectors of economy are approximately 50-50. Just 15 years ago, the share of public sector has been around 20 or 25 percent. So the state playing increasingly uh, prominent role in the economic development. As a result of that, Russian government should uh, obliged to play the leading role in those sectors there. In fact, what Adrian said, uh, we badly need public-private partnership. We need a cooperation between uh, international business, national private business, uh, academics, and government themselves. So the architecture of contemporary economy is more complicated than just private or public, and unfortunately, as I said, there were no reforms in Russia for more than 10 years. That's why we have just few tools which government can use to enforce 
innovation in the economy. That's why we have uh, quite uh, dangerous process when many specialists are leaving Russia in the innovation sector because of they don't have not just money. We, we do have a lot of seed funds or business angels in Russia, but we uh, don't have enough institutions which can provide for them uh, this decision. So coming back to, to your question, uh, exactly this decision is not strategic one, but you really point out very important process. Uh, the demand for Russian government to play uh, the leading role is too high, and uh, we know since Adam Smith the state in any case is not as effective management manager as a private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, Larissa, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia and China just uh, struck a 400 billion uh, gas deal, um, and do you think that China is the biggest economic winner uh, from the current political crisis between uh, Russia and the West? Well, you know, uh, it's not perceived like this in China. I know that in the U.S., even some Chinese scholars who teach at the U.S. universities, uh, they they have been uh, the protagonists of this idea that China is the biggest winner. As far as I know, it's not perceived like this in mainland China. So for China, if Russia is doing very well and Russia is economically strong, Russia being one of China's best political and economic partners, China will be better off as well. It's, it's not that, oh, you, you are a subject to... China, China has been under sanctions since 1989. Most of the sanctions have been lifted, but some of the, the arms embargo, for example, is still there. So China knows very well what sanctions mean for the economy, and sanctions never do good to any economy. So uh, for China has been pressing that it's always the most abuse of sanctions and is a is a you know is a policy tool. Uh, so I would say it's not that China is saying it's thinking okay you are sanctioned by us now and you are kind of desperate so you're going to be taking discount on oil and gas. Uh, I would rather say China is being worried that if Russia is uniquely relying on China for its finances, it's only relying on this gas deal for its finances, if Russia even has no money to invest in the infrastructure construction projects that are related to this gas deal, this is not going to be good for China, you know, because China in the end will need to pay more. If Russia is doing well, Russia is likely to give a discount, to be able to give a discount to China, than if Russia is economically very poor. So as far as I know, this is the opinion in the next opinion in China. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. And now we have uh, time for just one more question, and this is a question for all of you. Uh, what would you say is the uh, one most important initiative that policymakers could pursue uh, that would lead uh, the Russian economy in the right direction? Stanislav, um, could you answer this question? That, that's very difficult. I think they should proceed with uh, reforms of uh, economic system, with the changes in uh, uh, basic instruments of macroeconomic policy. So low inflation, uh, better re redistribution of resources in the budget. So macroeconomic policy should be uh, the, the, uh, the center of, of uh, new reforms. Adrian, what is your take on this? Well, certainly as an American, I, I, I think it's it's difficult for me to answer a question of sort of um, what my recommendations for the Russian government should be. I think in terms of U.S. cooperation this juncture for innovation, we really need to concentrate on people-to-people -people contacts. We need to make sure that uh, business and economic ties, educational ties are very much open. Uh, I think that, uh, especially with the universities, I think we're, we're dealing with researchers and scientists who have common goals to solve the world's challenges. I think it's very important that we keep those ties open. And I think from that, I think it can be mutually beneficial interests. And, um, not only commercial, but I think this will also uh, rise to the top, so to speak, in, in terms of political ties. Larissa, what do you think about that? OK, I have three points. So my first point is that uh, Russia needs to increase its R&D spending. The current R&D spending is at 13% of the Chinese R&D spending, for example. Mm -hmm. okay? 
So I'm not talking about the US. So without money, money is not the only thing. Without money, we definitely don't. The second thing, Russia it needs to stabilize its research institutional system, as Stanislav pointed out. So we've been having this Russian Academy of Sciences reform for a while now. We've been having this uh, PhD defense system reform. So people are basically unable even to, to defend their PhD thesis recently. Uh, and the, the, there has been this attempt to shift the scientific uh, re research from the Academy of Science to the universities, which might or might not be a good idea, but, you know, which is probably the trend in the world. But it's been really a while. and. Uh, some people come, some people go, and I am have an impression that the foreign researchers, our foreign counterparts, including the Chinese counterparts, are confused. They don't know who to talk to. Anymore. And maybe today these people are there, maybe tomorrow they will be gone. So this is not a good basis for the people to people exchanging. And the third point, I completely agree with Adrian, that we need to increase people to people exchanges. We need to understand each other better. Russia and China need to understand each other better, and I would say that Russia needs to understand foreign countries better. Russia is still kind of a, a little bit closed society. There has been a lot of opening up since uh, 1991, but well, we, we can still do it much more uh, in terms of opening up and people to people count. Um, Thanks again for joining us, and uh, thank you all for watching. Um, if you enjoyed uh, some of the ideas discussed here, please uh, download our quarterly report, The Future of Russia's uh, Innovation Economy, which will be released uh, uh, September 18th. Uh, it will be available uh, for our subscribers, and you can subscribe uh, now for free on our website. Um, thanks again so much, and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Yekaterina. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, goodbye.